Welcome to Deer Park Baptist Church once again. As you well know by now, I believe, you have heard through the newsletter or through other announcements, we're going to resume our worship services on Sunday, October 25th. We're going to have a bit of a different start time, at least as we start these days together once more. It'll be at 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock on October the 25th on Sunday. We'll gather in the sanctuary for worship, but we'll need to be wearing face masks, have our temperature taken, and keep a social distance. The room will be set up so we can do all of those things. We can be comfortable as we worship the Lord together. Won't it be great to be able to come back together and have worship in the same place we always have? We've missed each other. It's been seven months. So let's pray for those beginning days again. Also, I want to remind you that as you see the newsletter each week, you'll always notice a prayer list. We used to produce these on Wednesdays, but since we're not meeting on Wednesdays, we put it in the newsletter. It changes most weeks, and yet some names remain on the list because their loved ones have asked us to do so. Please always take note of what's listed there, who's listed there, rather, and uh, pray for them. Contact them if you also can, so they'll know of your love for them. Finally, I want to remind you of something I know you know, but when you want to see any of the videos that our church has ready to see, you can go directly to our website, DeerParkBaptistChurch.org, or you can go to YouTube or Facebook and type in for, uh, Deer Park Baptist Church, Louisville, Kentucky, and it'll bring up all the videos we've been doing since March. And that way you can see them and you can share them with your friends and family. Let other folks know about our church's messages that come midweek and on Sundays. I hope you'll take advantage of this wonderful ministry. Thank you for doing that. Let's read together a passage from Ephesians chapter 1, starting at verse 15. Paul says, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all. Last week, we spent some time considering the meaning of the very text we read once again this week. As you're well aware, there's far more to unpack in any Bible passage than just a one-time cursory reading. So let's think together once more on the passage from Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. The Apostle Paul has suffered five public whippings and three beatings. He has been stoned once, shipwrecked three times, and imprisoned more times than he can remember. Now he's on death row. He knows he will be executed soon. Probably a small square window provides the only light in his prison cell. So Paul places the parchment on the floor in the middle of the light and reminds and writes his friends, rather, back in Ephesus of his thoughts. If you and I were writing this letter, it very well might have begun, Dear Church, get me out of here. We have lawyers in our congregation. One of you must know somebody. I need to be released. Instead of that, Paul writes these words. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, will give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation that makes God known to you. While waiting for the warden to call his number, Paul prays that his church will have the same sense of God's presence that Paul is feeling.
Paul's life is about to come to a violent end, but it doesn't diminish his sense of God's grace. Paul has been through what must have been as though it was hell on earth, but what he feels more than anything else is that God is with him. He prays that his friends will know God's presence too. I was talking with someone not long ago and offering condolence and prayer support for them in a very strenuous time. And you know what they did? They reminded me of their love for our church and how they pray often every day for those who are experiencing their own tough patches of hard, difficult times. It was like Paul is doing in our text today. You know, let's face it. We don't usually pray as Paul does. Just check yourself compared to his words in Ephesians 1. I've been doing that with this text. We most often, I'd say, pray that our lives won't be so hard. We pray that what we want to happen will happen and in our time schedule. But what we need more than that more than wealth or health or easier lives, is a vision of God. We need to pray for a sense of God's constant care and his presence for every one of us. We need to be filled with the love of Christ. That's what Paul says. We need to recognize that the spirit of the living God is with us right now, just as the spirit has always been with us. This audacious prayer that is certain to be answered is the prayer that God will surround us on every side. That was Paul's hope. What do you and I need to learn from Paul's prayer life? Well, surely there are timely lessons among these nine verses that we just heard from Ephesians 1. So let's pray together for a moment. Heavenly Father, the words of Paul were written to other Christians. And yet we as believers in Jesus can find meaning and depth and purpose for our own prayers by remembering what he said. Let his prayer, Lord, be our own. Perhaps we will reword it a bit. We might add something to it or even let something go. But we thank you that we're able to commune with you in this form. Thank you that we have this prayer given to us in your holy word. And so we do pray. We pray with Paul, with thanksgiving and grace and peace. Lord, hear this prayer and all of our prayers that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.